Hey, welcome back. So in this lecture, we're going to look at how to measure the activation energy for a chemical reaction. And uh, this is one from our textbook, actually. So ozone is O3, and it can decompose into dioxygen and oxygen atoms. And we might be interested in knowing what the activation energy is. So what is the barrier in the reaction, right? So we've got reactants, we've got products, and reactants don't immediately change into products until they have enough energy upon collision to make it over a transition state. And that minimum energy we call the activation energy. Anything that lowers that's going to make that reaction faster. In fact, uh, this has been a problem in the last 40, 50 years with the propellants they use in things like sprays that actually contain compounds that when they get into the upper atmosphere can break down ozone and they actually cause the reaction to have a much lower activation energy and uh, the ozone just gets breaking down incredibly quickly. Now you might say, well, who cares about ozone? Ozone is one of those neat molecules that protects us from ultraviolet light. So it actually absorbs ultraviolet light and prevents nearly so much from coming down and striking us on the earth and giving us things like skin cancer. So how would we do something like that? So one of the things we can do, and I'll just go ahead and pull this from the textbook, is we can measure the rate of the reaction and uh, measure the rate constant as a function of temperature. So here's a bunch of data here that I've just pulled from our textbook. So we've run the reaction at uh, temperatures from 600 to 1200 Kelvin. We've determined the rate constant and uh, we've gone ahead and done it for, I guess, an additional um, half a dozen more temperatures and measured the rate constants. And so we would do an Arrhenius plot with this to find the activation energy. We would take the rate constants and we would take the natural log and plot them on the y-axis. And the same thing for the temperature, we would invert it and plot it on the x-axis. So to make the Arrhenius plot for this data here, we'd essentially take 600 Kelvin and uh, 3.37 times 10 to the 3, the rate constant, we would invert the temperature here. So we take 1 over the T, and over here we take the natural log of this value, and we get a data point. We plot it on the graph. And then we do the same thing for the 700 degree uh, temperature. We'd invert that value, and we take the rate constant, and we take the natural logarithm of it, and uh, we would plot this on the graph, and so on. So we take the 800 Kelvin and the uh, rate constant there, and we plot it on the graph. And eventually you would get a straight line uh, that you could then go ahead and measure the slope off. So we would take a spreadsheet or something and we would go ahead and measure the slope. And uh, the slope then would be minus the activation energy over R. So we could get the activation energy by just taking minus the gas constant and multiplying it by the slope of the reaction. So I've gone, gone ahead and pulled out the graph from our textbook. So uh, let's go ahead and look at it plotted properly and try and do the calculations. Okay, so here's our data. This is much better than the data I was drawing on the previous slide. So what do we want? We want the activation energy. We know the activation energy is equal to minus the gas constant times by the slope. So the gas constant that we want to use has values of joules per mole Kelvin. So it's 8.3145 joules per mole Kelvin. And you might say, well, why aren't we using the liter atmosphere per mole Kelvin one? Well, if you do that, you get an energy in liter atmospheres. And it's normal to measure energy in chemistry in joules. So we just kind of pick our gas constant that gives us our units of energy that we're used to, that of a joule. And uh, we need to get the slope. So the slope is given on here as, uh, let me see, so minus 1.12 times 10 to the 4. And interestingly enough, it doesn't have units. So we need to go ahead and figure out the units of slope. So what are the units of slope? So the units of slope, so they would be rise over run. Um, so that's the change in y over the change in x. And what are we plotting on the y-axis here? We're taking the logarithm of a rate constant. It's actually just a number. So in terms of units, it has no units. Or if you like, we can just write the number 1. But the change along the x-axis is going to be 1 over a temperature. So 1 over a temperature is going to have units of 1 over Kelvin. So the run is going to have units of 1 over Kelvin. And if we take 1 over 1 over Kelvin, then the units themselves are just going to be Kelvin. So I can go up here and I can fill out my units. And the reason I worry about units is, of course, units cancel out. So the Kelvin here and the Kelvin here cancel. And at the end of the day, I am left with something that's got units of joules per mole. Okay, and if I multiply, I can see the double negatives will cancel and give me a positive number, and it's going to be quite a big number, actually, so 93,100, and that is to three significant figures. And because that number is so large, instead of writing thousands, we can write it as kilojoules, so we can say 93.1 kilojoules per mole. And remember, a kilojoule is nothing other than 10 to the 3 of a joule. 
Now, if we wanted to find the pre-exponential factor, we could remember that the natural logarithm of the pre-exponential factor is the y-intercept. And uh, the y-intercept on this graph is uh, 26.8. And so if we just want a by itself, we can anti-logarithm. And so the anti-logarithm is e to the power. So a would be e to the power of 26.8. And that is kind of a large number, actually. It is something like 4.36 times 10 to the 11. So A, if we were interested in that, is a very large number. And what is that telling us? That's telling us something like uh, in every second, there's like 400 uh, billion collisions of these uh, reactant molecules. So, um, wow, that's a pretty enormous number, huh?